So greetings and welcome to the Wound Rounds webinar on wound photography for risk management. I'm so pleased that everyone is able to join us today for this great learning opportunity and also for those of you who are interested in getting CEUs, we'll be making those available as well. I'd like to first start by introducing you to our faculty member today, Ann Schurig. Anne holds the position of Vice President of Clinical Operations at Wound Rounds. And as you can see from her bio here, she has a long history of giving back to both the industry and the community. She's held a variety of roles in both industry and healthcare, in the, as in the healthcare provider side, and also um, across the clinical spectrum. So we're just thrilled to have Anne Schurig available with us today to talk to us about the points, uh, fine points of wound photography. About myself, I'm your moderator today. My name is Deb Kurtz, and I am an industry consultant in the area of long-term care and wound care, and it's my pleasure to be joining you today and guiding you through the questions and the content under Anne's leadership. So what I'd like to do now is turn this webinar over to our speaker, Anne Schurig, and ask her to take it away with what we're going to be learning today. Thanks, Anne. Thank you, Deb. It's great to have everyone join us today. Thanks for logging in and for giving your attention to this hot button topic. Wound photography, the pros and the cons, is something that's been debated in the industry for a long time. So we're going to start by focusing our camera lenses, pun intended, on what we're going to do today and go through our objectives. Uh, we're going to talk about the benefits of wound photography, um, both from a medical record standpoint, a operational standpoint, and as well as an education and communication tool. We're going to go through a few case studies to uh, illuminate some of those topics, and then we're going to talk about best practices. So let's get the dirty laundry right out of the way. Um, the cons about wound photography, we hear them all the time time in industry. We've heard about them for a long time. Um, certainly the first one to talk about is difficulty in getting your staff trained, getting your resources pooled, and having the right approach to educating your staff. And when we get to best practices, I'll be talking about the best ways or some tips and tricks to um, approach that topic. Um, the next one is just the plain old gross factor of wounds themselves. Uh, the story we hear over and over again, the objection we hear over and over again is that gruesome wound images are going to be uh, blown up into a 4 by 6 format and put up in the courtroom or during chart review to uh, elicit the um, sympathies and the shock and the awe factor out of those who are viewing those photos. And so. We look to the literature and we say, what does the literature tell us about this topic and how can we support the pro or the con about this? And unfortunately, the literature and the guiding resources like the NPUAP, the National Presser Ulcer Advisory Panel, or the WOCN, or the AHRQ, those bodies that give us our guidelines on what we should and should not be doing or how to best do our practice in wound care, um, they're pretty wishy-washy on this topic. They will uh, come out, and I will give you some examples of how they support uh, the proper way to do wound photography, and if you're doing wound photography, how to best approach it within your medical record, um, but they will not take a stand and say, yes, you should be taking photos, or no, you should not. So it leaves us to interpret those guidelines ourselves. Cells. So let's get to the benefits of wound photography just in the medical record itself. Um, wound photos attached to an assessment are a great thing when you have varying clinicians doing your assessments across the continuum of care. Um, certainly your clinical experts that you have working with you can have faster, broader, more comprehensive discussions with that bedside clinician if they have a photo to back up the written or the verbal report that they're getting. You know, the, the photo adds visual confirmation to the written word and it helps them guide staff from a distance or even in person. Um, it tells the story of what's going on with that wound in a way that the written word may not be able to. Uh, showing a photo to patient and family can assist everyone in communicating and staying on the same page. Uh, there's a client in the Midwest that is in the habit of taking pictures on admission um, and when photo wounds are identified, even if they're facility acquired, 
and then sharing those photos and getting a written confirmation from the patient and or the family members that they have been shown those photos, that the plan of care has been discussed with them, and that they're aware of the fact that the wound exists. This helps them draw drive down their risk of liability and helps them manage that better. Um, it also pro provides solid proof of what that wound looked like when it was first identified, whether it's present on admission or whether it was facility acquired. Um, those photos can be now uploaded into many of the electronic medical records that are being used across the continuum of care, so it allows for visual tracking as well as written tracking um, with easy access within that EMR. As a communication tool, it's a great tool to assist us in um, what is going on between clinicians. Um, consultations can be done via digital images, um, and my slide is out of order. <laughs> um, and it, it helps with it helps with communication across the continuum. It also helps, let's talk about how it helps with um, that comprehensive assessment that we want to do. So many of our EMRs that we're dealing with now are a checkbox format. And so it only allows us to check what is or is not present. And those advanced clinicians that are used to doing a comprehensive note um, with a written verbal dissertation of what they're seeing or not seeing in that wound bed can get frustrated by the limited checkbox options that they're there. If you add a photo to that checkbox format, now you have a more comprehensive assessment that's going on and it helps us um, see what's better. We've heard for years the adage, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. And that's something that we've thrown around for a long time. I personally wanted to know where that came from. So just as an aside, I went and I looked up where that phrase came from, and it actually dates all the way back to 1921. There was a great marketer by the name of Frederick Bernard, and he, won, he was the first one who went into marketing and said, hey, let's put pictures with the written word, and we're going to put it on the side of streetcars, and that's going to really help your advertising. And that was his slogan, one look, work, one look is worth a thousand words. And he was the man who launched that. And here we are, you know, nearly a hundred years later and we're still using that phrase. And it still is true. If you can look at a photo and then compare it to the written word, you get a better picture of what's trying to be represented in that medical record. Additionally, photos can be attached um, to the wound record for historical reference. Uh, you know, for years we used Polaroid cameras, we used um, SLR cameras, and I had a horrible experience, um, unfortunately. For years I was taking pictures with, with, you know, the old Polaroid with the grid on it. I was working in a large um, university-based hospital here in Chicago where I'm from, and we took all these great wound photos and they were attached with staples or tape into the chart. As the university moved to electronic format, they scanned all that old documentation, which was wonderful, except the scans were done in black and white. So as we went back to look at past records of residents and patients, we couldn't um, we couldn't reference those wounds real accurately. Now with digital photography and digital records, we can attach those records and have a better representation of what has been going on with that resident or that patient. As a clinical tool, then we're um, able to um, maintain the integrity of the wound better. You know, every time we take the dressing off, that wound temperature drops down to either room temperature or maybe even lower if the, if the cleanser we're using is cooler than wound temperature. And we know that wounds like to heal at body temperature 98, 98.6, so we're losing healing time every time we take a dressing off to let somebody else view that wound bed, right? Um, we, uh, maybe the physician comes in after you've done, or the nurse practitioner or physical therapy wants to see it. That's losing wound time. Also, all those dressing changes use up our advanced wound products more readily, and so we're wasting time and money uh, every time we have to uncover that wound. Photos can be a great education tools with our staff. It can help us identify um, where we went right, where we went wrong. So it, ho it can help illuminate uh, educational needs in our staff, holes in our education, where staff can then be further um, guided and, and educated on maybe this is what a DTI versus uh, what a bruise is, or um, the differences, the subtle differences between a stage two and a stage three on a shallow area. So that's a great 
great use of wound photography. Serial photographs are great because then you can see the evolution of the wound and show what they should be looking for and what they should expect to see. So it's a great way to educate that way. And we're going to have a case study that's going to point that out in a few minutes. Um, wound photos can be a great way to enhance communication to your referral sources. So you can take those wound photos back to um, whether it's a specific physician or a specific discharge planner or hospital and say, look, this is what you're sending us and look at the great job we did to it. So if you're looking to make wound care a center of clinical excellence within your facility, that's a great way to communicate back to those referral sources what a great job you're doing and um, show them. It's one thing to say, yeah, we have great outcomes. It's another to be able to really demonstrate to them what great outcomes can be. Um, it's also a great way to uh, help with your reimbursement sources, those of you who are dealing with case managers. Sometimes those case managers get too fixated just on the size of the wound, and we always know that this, or oftentimes the size of the wound is the last thing to change. You know, drainage will change, tissue types will change, wound beds will change before we see size change. So if all they're looking for is, is numbers when they do their review for reimbursement, then they're out of the loop. So wound photography can really help in that regard as well. From a risk management standpoint, it provides a permanent record of the condition of the, work, of the wound, both, both at baseline as well as at intervals. So it can show that healing over time and really um, help out with what's going on. I had a wound nurse who received a complex wound from her referral source. It was a very necrotic wound, and she was doing her best right from admit to get that wound on track. Shortly after admit, the wound physician came in. He was the referral source. It was his impression that that wound had been debrided before it left the hospital. So when he got to the skilled facility and saw this heavily necrotic sloppy wound, he was irate and he just wanted to read the riot act to that poor wound nurse. She fortunately had documentation, photo documentation of what that wound looked like on admit and she was able to show him, hey, this is what I inherited and look at what I've done with it just in the short time that I've had it. Boy, that changed the whole conversation right there. It also increased the confidence of that wound nurse in that physician's eyes and created a really strong bond between the two of them and he's now become a very strong referral source for her and a great partner in care for the residents that they have. Additionally, wound photos taken at regular intervals help provide evidence that that wound was really um, regularly assessed on a schedule, so it supports that written documentation. So here we get into what the literature does and does not tell us, and, and what they're saying here is that photography offers a better picture, both, both uh, from a wound dimension standpoint as well as from the efficacy and, and effectiveness of your therapies that you're doing. Both these quotes come from the Frequently Asked Questions page on the NPUAP site. So they're, they're supporting why wound photography is good, but again, they're not coming out and saying pro or con should you take photos. Um, surveyors, lawyers, auditors, they get so fixated on the minutia, on the numbers, instead of how a look a wound looks or feels or smells or is behaving. So adding wound photography to that written word can really um, shed light on what's going on in that wound bed. Here's another great quote, and this um, article by Caliano is referenced at the back of the slides. Um, it's also at the bottom of this slide. This is a terrific article to read about whether you should or should not be photographing wounds and why. It's a great article. Um, but it talks about the litigation side of it. So this is a reference to, you know, are they going to put this big photo up in the court of law and shock everybody? And the bottom line is, if you don't have good clinical photographs, that attorney might turn around and use that against you. So here's a little example. This is an exercise for you. We've all seen this, or at least many of us have seen this in our doctor's, our eye doctor's office, right? They put this in front of you and they ask you to read the chart and then they flip the little lenses and say, which is better, one or two? So I want to see how good your vision is. So tell me which one, which is better, this wound or number two? Number one or number two? They're both stage three wounds. They both have pink tissue in them. They both have... Um, originally had large dimension to them. But the photo on the left 
I kid you not, it comes from a website called www.decubitusulcervictims.com. Can you believe that website's out there? But it is, and it's full of gory pictures like this. So in a court of law, if you don't have good wound photos and all you have is stage three pressure ulcer with pink and it measures X, and hopefully you have good measurements in your documentation, and you don't have a photo, they might put up the picture on the left in the courtroom and shock that audience by saying, hey, this is what a stage three pressure ulcer looks like. And it doesn't adequately represent what is going on with the, the specific patient and the specific case at hand. So I'd much rather have state the one on the right rather than the one on the left put up in my court of law. So the next photo we're going to look at, we're going to talk about what's right and what's wrong. Um, so t let me tell you what's wrong with this photo. Pretty much nothing except that that awful wound exists. This is an extravagation of an IV on the back of a hand, for those of you unfamiliar with it. And so what's right about this photo is we have a gloved hand. We also have a gown on, which means that we're probably trying to protect this poor soul from the bugs and germs that we carry. Um, it's well lit with natural light, which is very important. Use natural light as often as you can as opposed to artificial lighting like a flashlight or a targeted lamp. And it's got, most importantly, a measuring guide in the wound picture for reference. So gloved hands, good lighting, clean background, measuring guide. This is a great example of a good photo. This, on the other hand, is questionable. Um, it's well lit, I'll give them that, um, but uh, we don't have a gloved hand. We don't have a measuring guide. Uh, personally, I would have preferred that the photo be taken just a little bit more to the right so I could see a little bit more of the vascularization of the forefoot. But it does support good wound photography in that it tells you a picture. If I had to describe via a checkbox format in my EMR this wound, this foot, I'd have a heck of a time. The vascularization between the first toe and the fourth toe is, is dramatically different. The nail beds are different. We have an amputated fifth toe there. I mean, this would just be a nightmare to try to describe without a narrative note. So um, adding a photo to this really would, um, to my checkbox documentation really would enhance what I'm doing. So in that regard, it's good. Let's move on to our first case study. Our first case study is an elderly man. He had multiple comorbidities and multiple wounds. Um, he had an insensate left lower extremity and was admitted with a DTI. And while the wound progressed to healing, um, it was difficult to see strictly through the written documentation. If you can see, notice, um, first of all, we have good lighting. We have good consistent angle and positioning between those photos. With the exception of the second and the last photo, we do have a measuring guide in each one of those photos. So those are all positive things. What this allowed us to do was to see that, you know, in the first two, three weeks, we didn't see a lot of change to that blood blister in the center of this heel. And so strictly by measurements, it would appear that this wound was not improving very much in the first three weeks. Yet if you look at that overall picture, the peri wound margin is improving, the overall color of the heel is improving, and so we are seeing good um, healing and progression of this wound. Uh, the other thing is that when you're looking just at measurements in a chart, if you change caregivers, then you're trying to compare just by measurements, did this wound improve or not? Now the team can see and they can look back over the serial photos and they can see that yes, even though the size hasn't changed dramatically, the overall heel is improving and so yes, I have seen improvement this week over last week. The other thing that this is a great example of, and this is what I referenced in the beginning, is it's a great example of using serial photography as a teaching tool. So this is a great serial um, set of photos to use as an education with your staff to say this is what a DTI can look like and this is what the evolution towards healing of a DTI can look like. So this is what you should expect or not expect to see as you progress through time with a heal ulcer that's a DTI. So it's a great opportunity to use your own information, your own records to educate either new staff or existing staff on what to expect or what not to expect. 
Here's another case study that really um, shows where wound photography can be helpful to your staff. So we've got a middle-aged woman with a lot of comorbidities, including diabetes and end-stage renal disease. And she had an AV fistula created um, for her dialysis, and we had a very at-risk incision because of her wound history and her medical history overall. So it was slightly reddened on admit. We still had sutures in place. Again, we've got consistent positioning of the camera and consistent um, documentation with lighting and um, measuring guide within the wound photos. And they were taken at a consistent interval apart. What this allowed them to do is document good healing over time. It also enabled them to evaluate one week over the other, is that redness consistent with last week, and am I seeing redness that is normal post-op healing, or am I seeing redness that might indicate infection, which she was at high risk for? So being able to evaluate one over the other gave them a good comparison and made sure that they stayed on track and they caught any subtle changes quickly so that they could intervene in a timely manner. And our last his study is, of course, one of the most impactful that I've seen in a long time. This is an elderly woman with, just look at that complex history. She's just got alphabet soup of, of um, comorbidities and problems going on. And on top of all of her problems, um, medically, she's a paraplegic and a smoker. She was admitted with this large DTI that unroofed um, right before she was admitted. And so we wanted to document very clearly what came into the facility. And it could appear that this wound has actually gotten worse or changed over time. But if you can look very closely at the time and date stamps on the bottom of those photos, those three photos were taken all about a minute apart. So what this demonstrates is that positioning of a patient can really change the appearance of a wound. And had we not documented right on admission the differences, that middle photo is with the patient laying without any tension on the wound site at all. The photo to the left has a slight amount of tension, and the photo on the right is where they put, you know, they spread the cheeks and really put a lot of tension on that wound. So the positioning of the patient really changed how this wound appeared and presented itself to the caregiver, and the admitting nurse wanted to demonstrate that to the rest of the team. Then she took the largest set of measurements with tension on that wound and made sure that those were the baseline measurements that were used. Otherwise, perhaps we would have this wound um, be assessed by different caregivers or at different times with the patient in different positions. And so the wound over time could have appeared that it got larger and then smaller and larger and then smaller. So that would have been really confusing in the chart. It would have been really disruptive to the plan of care. And it would have been really hard to track whether healing was taking place based on measurements alone. So this really helped out the team from a communication standpoint. It also helped them out from a reimbursement and from a risk and liability standpoint to make sure that we got the best representation of this wound site on admission and got the best baseline entered into the system. So from there, we're going to talk about best practices. How do we get to a place where we're sure we're getting the best information into our charts in the most consistent way? And the first thing is to write a good policy. You need to have photo permissions in your informed consent documents on admission. That's the easiest and most straightforward way to accomplish photo consent within your facility. If you have a separate photo consent, then you have to rely on a process that says, okay, every time a wound is identified, now we got to have to we're going to have to get this separate consent. And if the patient or resident can't sign for themselves, then we have to wait until we can get the power of attorney or the family members in to sign that consent. And it just complicates the whole process. When you incorporate them into your um, uh, informed consent documents on admission, that's all addressed and take care of. This website that's up on the page and referenced on the bottom there is a great place to start. It gives you sort of a guideline on where to start with your policies and with your um, wording, and it's um, a good step-off place if you need a guideline on that. Um, so, like I said, if you're going to have a policy, if you're going to take photos, have a wound photography policy. And the bottom line is, is that if we don't take the photos, you know the family will. <laughs> 
and I know this is kind of funny um, photo of, of old cell phones and someone pointed out to me that none of these cell phones takes pictures, but you can bet that every cell phone every family member has in their pocket can take photos right now. I had a long conversation that um, started out with a client that did not want to take photos at all and their attorney, who happened to also be a nurse, was staunchly against wound photos and she had been and we had many discussions about it and she said, if I had my druthers there would never be wound photos in a record. However, she came to recognize that cell phone photos from a family member were more detrimental than well policied, well structured, consistent, clinically documented wound photos and so she agreed to change the policy within that organization and now the whole enterprise is taking wound photos and putting them in their medical record in their electronic um, format. So this really is a pendulum swing away from that old mentality and I'm hearing more and more about this type of um, attitude. Um, I have to say, as always, if you write a policy, you need to follow it. So you need to be specific. Photos need to be done on a consistent schedule, and so that should be outlined in your policy. Um, just saying when deemed necessary or saying um, uh, critical wounds or complicated wounds, that just doesn't cut it anymore. We need to be specific about how and when we're taking photos. Um, we had a case of, of someone who, back to the cell phone issue, of someone who was not taking moon photos and unfortunately an unscrupulous family came in, um, rolled their family member over. It was a um, present on admission wound and we had uh, documented that, but they uh, threw some IV caps into the bed and then rolled their family member on them and took a picture and said this is why that wound was there. It wasn't because of what um, we did at home, it was because they were laying on these IV caps and they tried to admit that. Of course it all got thrown out, but do you want to take that risk of having that in your building? No. So let's go back to that uh, vision test. Which one is better, number one or number two? This talks about how you're going to handle uh, when a patient decides they don't want wound photos, even if you have a policy that says you're going to take them. Um, unfortunately, the picture on the uh, left is not perfectly clear, but what's written above that word photo is no. So what happened was they were in the habit of taking photos. Um, the patient refused that day, whether it was just that they were tired or they were in a cranky mood or who knows why, but they didn't want their, pic their wound photographed that day. So the nurse wrote on her palm, no wound photo taken, and took a picture of it. Uh, no, I don't think I would want that in my medical record. So if you're going to allow for refusion of photos, which why would you not, then you need to have a standardized format. So this other facility, they had a standardized page that the nurse could take a picture of when the patient was and then they would have to annotate somewhere in the record why the photo was refused and what other care was delivered. Best practices. How do we make sure that we're doing this the best way we can? Um, first of all, from a HIPAA guidelines, let's talk about that. And um, we need to include in the photo um, labeling of date, time, and some patient identifier. But it's no longer acceptable to put a patient name or even patient initials on that. Now, there are some softwares out there and some of the EMRs that allow for peripherals um, that incorporate uh, automatic wound photography as part of the medical record, and those peripherals and those additional softwares will time and date stamp those photos for you. If you're using a digital camera of some type, then you want to um, use the time and date stamp that those cameras allow for, but then you're still going to have to put a patient identifier into that so you can use the medical record number if you need to include your own um, patient identifier in that. Um, make sure that there are no faces of the patient, faces of visitors, family members, or other people in the room in your wound photography. Um, those could be um, interpreted as HIPAA violations. Also, you want to make sure that you drape sensitive areas such as the genitals, 
um, so that you maintain patient dignity as much as possible. And you know, since so many of the pressure ulcers that we deal with are in the genital area, on the buttocks, on the sacrum, on the coccyx, it's important to try to be as sensitive as we can using a washcloth or a towel to drape areas that are not necessary to be in the photo. Uh, it can be a little challenging if you're dealing with traumas on the head and neck or the face or you're photographing rashes or abrasions to those areas, but do your best to obscure the patient's identity whenever um, possible. On your page is a great tool to use. The reference for the checklist has um, been referenced at the bottom of the page and at the back of the deck, so feel free to use it. Keep it simple and straightforward. Good lighting source is important. Make sure it's natural light whenever possible. You have to use artificial light, make it an overhead light, never use a lamp or a flash, flashlight directly on the wound. The moisture in the wound bed on the tissues will cause a glare and obscure your photo. Make sure that you have good standardized distance from, from the wound. If you're doing a close-up of a specific area, you want to be six to eight inches from that area and consistently maintain that. If you're going to do a more broad perspective or if the wound is too large to capture in a close-up, you want to be 10 to 12 inches from that wound. Keep standard direction. Always use head as 12 o'clock and use um, your camera direction every time. As I mentioned at the beginning, a good wound photo has only gloved hands and has um, a measuring tape in every photo for a frame of reference and make sure that your patient identifiers, if they're not provided by the software that you're using, make sure that the patient identifiers on your measuring tape are for um, an MRN only um, or uh, a simple directive and not patient name. Um, you don't need to time and date stamp it if your camera puts that on there as well for you. So keep it as simple as you possibly can. And again, make sure that there are no other patient identifiers like their face or that of family members or visitors in the background of the photo. Additional things that we want to talk about are infection control. And this is um, a challenge with cameras. We know that cameras have a lot of moving parts. Um, so you want to look for the simplest, most direct cameras that you can get if you're not using a peripheral or a software that provides you with an embedded camera. So uh, there are a lot of great digital cameras out there now that are meant for outdoor use, that are water resistant, have protected lenses, and have very few moving, moving parts. Those are the type that you want to look towards so that um, you don't have a lot of cracks and crevices for those buggies to get into. Make sure that you follow your infection control practices just like you would with any other mobile piece of equipment, say your glucose monitors. Um, you would want to have the same standards and the same policy and procedure applied to your wound cameras as well. As you educate your staff for competency, you want to make sure that it's incorporated into your orientation for new hires and that it becomes part of your annual or biannual competency just like any other skills checklist that you would do. And you would want to make sure that your frequency for revalidation of that competency is clearly defined. You want to talk about um, when you're going to take those wound photos, right? So in your policy, you need to outline, are we just going to do them on admission and discharge? Are we going to do them admission, discharge, and weekly with our comprehensive assessment and measurements? Um, do we want to make sure we do them with a change in condition, or is that too abstract for you? So you need to look at your current operations and who's responsible for those operations, and then decide what part of that is going to go into your policy. Also talk about where or which part of the EMR that wound is going, that wound photograph is going to appear. So does it automatically get attached to your um, documentation via your software or are you going to import those photos and where are those photos going to live? Is there a miscellaneous tab or a wound tab you can um, import them to and make sure that they're consistently going to the same place? Who's responsible or who's allowed to take wound, wound photographs? Is it any of the clinical staff within your organization? Only those that are responsible for those comprehensive assessments? Um, 
You want to make sure that your admitting staff, your admitting team um, has those skills and those competencies so that those photos can be taken on admission and not wait until a wound nurse or a wound team member is present, especially if you don't have 24-7 coverage of your wound team or wound experts. Who has access to the photos? Anybody with access to the medical record or only those clinicians who um, can view and add clinical information? And how are they secured? Um, what types of wounds are you going to photograph, right? So are we just going to do pressure ulcers? Are we going to do complicated surgicals? There's that word again, complicated. So anything that's dehist or infected, or are we going to photograph all wound types across this continuum that we're keeping track of? So those are some um, considerations for you to put into your policy and make sure that you outline. So it's clear to you, it's clear to your staff so they have a nice solid guideline to go by, and it's clear for your facility to make sure that in a litigation standpoint, it's very um, well outlined and uh, you have your bases covered. Finally, I have to say, have to say once again with policy, if you have a policy, make sure you follow it. So I'm going to turn it back to Deb. We've been getting questions popping into our question box through the whole presentation. So I'm going to take some questions from the group and see what we can come up with to, for answers for you. And thank you. That was an excellent presentation, and I know that I learned a lot about a lot of the considerations that facilities need to have when developing wound photography guidelines. What I want to quickly do is uh, share with everyone the references that Ann has put together for your review. So there's a couple pages of these references, and rest assured this will be part of the handouts that you'll be receiving if you haven't already. And we wanted to thank our sponsor for the, today's webinar, which is Wound Rounds. Wound Rounds is a, a, is a prevention, wound prevention and risk management tool in the area of wound care and also is enabled with photographic features. What I'd like to do now is turn the floor over to Anne as she has a, a few remaining moments for some questions. And I'm looking at some of the questions that have come in. And um, it seems that there's a, a great deal of confusion about patient identifiers um, in the photos. And maybe, Anne, you could talk about, from your experience, what are common mistakes that are made in patient identifiers and um, areas that, uh, that facilities should be mindful of when developing their policies. Anne's just getting her audio back. Okay, Deb, so it can be uh, a little try to figure out what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. So first of all, you want to ta talk with your own litigation and your own human resources department and decide what your organization is comfortable with. Generally, we want to keep those patient identifiers as limited as we possibly can. Most of the um, literature, if you look at the literature references at the back of the deck, most of the literature says that an, an MRN number is an acceptable identifier on a measuring tape within that because that MRN is unique to your organization. And so if that leaked outside of your organization, it would be challenging or difficult for someone to identify who that patient was. So an MRN would be acceptable. Um, there are a few references that will say that uh, Patient initials are acceptable, but that can be confusing. If you have a Sam Smith and you have a Sally uh, Sutton and you put SS on a photo and you have to import that photo, um, it can be challenging to figure out who is who when you're importing those photos. So I would go with the MRN if I had to put a patient identifier on the tape. And thank you. Um, we all appreciate the clarity around this subject. Um, another question, and you can see that HIPAA is really dominating a lot of the questions that are coming in, um, is, uh, is uh, one participant is seeking guidance about sending photos over the Internet, that is, wound photos over the Internet. Um, what concerns do they need to have in regards to remaining HIPAA compliant? Any thoughts on this, Anne? Okay, so around HIPAA, we know that anybody who has clinical need of information of that patient has access to that record um, 
as part of the care team, and that's what a patient or resident consents to when they sign that HIPAA waiver. Um, if you are sending photos via email, you want to make sure that A, those photos are, again, um, not having outside patient identifiers that could get hijacked on the internet. You also want to make sure that you password protect those files and send the password for the file in a separate um, document or have an agreed upon password with your referral source so that they cannot be hijacked off the net um, for misuse, as it were. Um, so those would be the protections that I would put around um, putting photos in an email to a clinician. And thank you for that. So moving on to another question that's come in is this facility is moving away from their policy of allowing employees to take wound photographs using their personal cell phones. So is there moving away from the use of personal cell phones towards a policy of using a facility provided camera? I'm wondering if you can share any tips or success stories on how facilities can make this transition. Sure. So it's very important that you don't allow personal um, electronics. I know that some organizations have moved to BYOD, bring your own device, to work um, for use in accessing records um, and other software that may be available within the organization. However, the caution against wound photos is even though you delete, you think you've deleted that photo, the photos can stay in the gallery in the background um, and be discoverable in ways to hackers that we can't even imagine. So you would never want a personal cell phone to have wound photos of your patients on them and walk out of your facility on a daily basis. If it's a device, um, some of the softwares can now be accessed on an iOS or Android device, be it a tablet or a phone, and we're using those to access our software or documentation software. If that is a facility um, supplied device and the device stays within the organization and does not belong to an individual and walk out with that individual, then you can use those securely. But if it's personal um, equipment, I would not be taking uh, patient-centered photos on a personal device and letting them leave my building. And thank you for those great answers. And a big thanks also to our sponsor, Wound Rounds, for making today's webinar happen. We wanted to let you know we appreciate so much your joining us today. Check your email for communication from Wound Rounds, including information about handouts, next steps on continuing education, and keep your eyes peeled for the next webinar in our ongoing series of Wound Education. For now, I'm Deb Kurtz, and on behalf of Ann Schurg, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. And again, a big thanks to Wound Rounds. Thank you.